So, just to introduce myself, my name is Mike Biscarich. I'm at the University of Minnesota in Hennepin County Medical Center. Um, and we have a really great panel here today of, I think, a diverse group of K awardees um, who had, took very different paths to their K awards and uh, I think shows some of the different ways you can approach this. Um, our main goals out of this is to make this as useful for you guys as possible and make it as kind of real in terms of real stories uh, as we can. So while uh, we'll provide some brief introductions to both ourselves, our stories, and they'll each introduce themselves to you in about five minutes, after that it's basically going to be a question and answer session. Now, if you guys uh, have questions, feel free to come up to the mic right away or if something sparks your uh, interest. Otherwise, I have a whole sheet of different things we can ask them and things that I thought about when I was going through my K Award and uh, I found helpful and trying to demystify the process. So just before we start out, a quick show of hands, how many of you have, either, have submitted a K previously? Anyone? We've got these guys? couple and then anybody uh, <laughs> writing or, or thinking about submitting one in the next year or two so hopefully this will be highly relevant these guys um, I think the great opportunity here is they can provide you very realistic answers um, and and won't dance around it and different answers depending on what they did so feel free to ask them questions or flag us down afterwards I think there's a lot of good information in the room so uh, with that um, I'm gonna let each of our uh, uh, speakers kind of introduce themselves. Um, just a quick note, Jane Scott was supposed to be here um, just to put a little plug in for K Awards um, and she was unable to make it. We very graciously have another NHLBI program officer here in the room who can also uh, provide some feedback. So uh, just to give you guys a heads up about that. And just to kind of fill in what uh, for Jane here, she is a huge believer in K Awards in advancing emergency care. She's been a huge advocate for us at the federal level um, at NHLBI for quite a while now and she firmly believes and I strongly agree with her that in order to build emergency care research we need more strong uh, researchers and the pathway to independence uh, really uh, starts with K Awards uh, in your postdoctoral years. So a uh, huge plug for that and with that I'll have Candace introduce herself. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, so I'm Candace McNaughton. Um, I am from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I also work at the Tennessee Valley um, uh, Healthcare System VA. We we actually straddle both of those. Um, so um, do you want me? And I just want to make sure. Do you want me to go through the whole? Okay. All right. Just, all right. Lovely. So um, your slides are next. Your slides are on there. Awesome. Okay. Great. Um, so. I have done a little bit of research. I started dabbling in research uh, as a medical student at WashU in St. Louis um, and did some work on uh, patient safety and prescribing behaviors and actually didn't even include that. Um, but it carried through through emergency medicine residency at Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, I had enough motivation to then go on and do a two-year MPH with a VA fellowship in um, uh, patient safety and quality improvement. And, and in that fellowship is sort of where folks really decided that they're going to do operations versus research. And it was pretty clear to me after the MPH that I really enjoy research. Operations is fine, but I never felt like I really had enough information to make an informed decision. I really wanted to know the whys and hows. And so that's sort of where it became clear to me that research was really where I needed to go. Um, and to do that, um, I was fortunate, uh, Alan Storo, who spoke in the last session, was one of my mentors. Um, uh, he, uh, um, we have a, a, a K-12 funded by the NHLBI at Vanderbilt, uh, and I was fortunate enough to um, apply and receive uh, 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 the opportunity to be in a spot for the K-12 uh, there. So I did a three-year uh, K-12 uh, with the NHLBI, in which I focused on hypertension and elevated blood pressure uh, among patients who came to the emergency department uh, and we looked at medication adherence, health literacy and health determinants in those patients and so it served as a really nice way to prepare for a K-23 uh, which I applied for as a K-12 um, uh, and then um, was successful on the third try uh, for K-23 um, and um, 
actually recently finished that up about a year ago and now have multiple funding sources um, after having transitioned off of that. Um, in terms of my research goals, um, the K-12 to K-23 was a really nice transition, although uh, it may, it's not an opportunity that everybody has. There are other, uh, there are other ways to uh, re obtain funding while you're preparing for your K-23 or putting it in, because it, it, in general, there are exceptions, but in general it takes like, multiple uh, applications, and so it can take 18 months, two years. Um, for me, the K-12 was a nice opportunity to refine my scientific question and um, provide preliminary research and uh, uh, results for the K-23. Um, in terms of uh, things that are a little bit unusual, um, I did do a PhD during the K-12, uh, and so there are some advantages and disadvantages to that, and I'm happy to talk afterwards. Um, for example, it just takes more time to do the PhD. I felt like I needed more methodology um, uh, and experience. And I was, even with that PhD, able to justify getting a K-23 because I needed additional training in qualitative uh, methods uh, and in doing clinical trials. So my PhD is in epidemiology. And so uh, it was a little bit unusual, but not outside of uh, the realm of what I've seen uh, happen at Vanderbilt. Um, and I still am working on pharmacokinetics and dynamics and things that I never thought I would do, actually, but have become incredibly useful. So, um, and then I'm gonna turn the time over. Um, I just want a quick shout out to my mentors. Throughout the whole process, the mentorship um, evolved, depending on my needs. Uh, Jane Scott actually was really instrumental in the program officers. Um, were incredibly helpful as I went through this process, but my, my mentorship team, uh, Dr. Rothman, Sean Collins, and Ellen Storo uh, were invaluable in helping me along the way. So I'm gonna turn the time back over. All right, um, so my name is Elizabeth Schoenfeld. I come from Bay State, which is a part of UMass. Um, and my pathway is uh, different from a lot of other people's pathways. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that it's sort of the narrative. So my case started um, not quite a year ago. I have a case from AHRQ to use shared decision making to address the use of CT scans in patients with kidney stones. So the idea is that we build a decision aid, we decrease CT scans, we increase shared decision making in, the, in this particular patient population. Um, so in my narrative, I have included the elements that I think led me to be successful and actually get the K. So it points out, so what do you need and at which point? My story is different from other people's stories, so it's different from your story and it's different from their story. And so the point is to sort of find the common things and the things that you sort of need to get the K. So just to orient you to my slides, uh, the years are clearly the years. So we're gonna march through the years. And you see the last five years have a lot more going on because they're sort of more important. And the publications at the bottom, the top is uh, first author pu publications and sort of what year they happened. And the bottom is uh, any publications that I'm on. So that gives you some metrics. So this is essentially like the metrics of my life for the last 10 years. All right, ready? First, um, I graduated residency. Nope, sorry. I had my daughter. I graduated residency two months later and uh, I started fellowship. Uh, I chose an ultrasound fellowship. So when I graduated residency in 2009, um, research fellowships existed, but nobody at my residency had done one, and so I didn't actually even know that they existed. So despite the fact that I had four papers in the works, and I loved research, and people knew I loved research, at no point did I have a mentor say, hey, you really like research, you should think about a research fellowship. So, so that happened, okay? And then I had, I had that one. All right, what happened next? So then I started a new job. I moved up to Bay State um, after my ultrasound fellowship. During my ultrasound fellowship, I had very little mentorship when it came to research. I had to do a research project. I did a very ill-advised research project. Took lots of time, never ended up publishing it. Really liked research, but again, no mentorship. Oh, so the mentorship line you see up there, so the mentorship line is still very low. Um, so I went to Bay State. So Bay State was looking for an ultrasound trained person and my chair, who's wonderful, was very excited that I was interested in research. Bay State is a very untapped research potential. It's one of the biggest hospitals in the Northeast. It has huge volumes, doesn't have a ton of research. It's academic, it's affiliated with UMass, um, but not a ton of researchers. So my, my boss was very happy that I was interested in research. So I took this academic job. Um, I applied for a little internal grant. I didn't get it. Across the top, you're gonna see rejected grants, okay? Um, and then I took over someone else's grant because he was leaving. Didn't give me any protected time, but it did give me some experience, so that was nice and that was helpful. Let's see what happens next. So then, 12 months in, I have child number two, and I promptly realize that it's very, very hard to have 
two physicians and two children and to continue to be full-time academic, and I went part-time. Um, and because I was part-time, so I was 50% clinical, I was able to actually do a little bit of research, but of course at that point it's completely unpaid, right? So I'm being paid for 50% clinical, I'm spending time with children, I'm spending time trying to get shit together, and, I, um, and I'm getting a little bit of research done. And I will call those years sort of the elbow grease research years, right? So that's the research that you get done because you just get, you get it done. You don't have any money, you don't have any sports staff, you just try to get stuff done. It's not gonna be perfect, but you are trying to sort of get experience. So that's the elbow grease years. So I went 50% at that time. So then, when child number two was about a year and a half, we got our first au pair. So you're gonna see the, the life family stuff at the bottom. And the reason it's there is because these are the metrics that led to me getting a K, and I wouldn't have gotten the K without the mentorship, and I wouldn't have gotten the K without the au pairs. All right, so um, after we had the au pair, and there's a little bit of space there, after we had the au pair for a year, um, I was like, okay, okay, my kids are getting bigger, I can do this, I can get back into this, and I went to Embers. Has anyone heard of Embers? Do you guys know what Embers is? So ASAP puts on this nine-day research course. It's great in some ways, it's very misguided in other ways. Um, after nine days, they were like, you're good, go out, be researchers. And you're sort of like, awesome, I'm in. I totally wanna to be a researcher. What it taught me is that I love talking about research. Your project has absolutely nothing to do with anything I know anything about. I still wanna to talk to you about it, I wanna hear about it. I wanna go through like, what's the best design for that? Um, and so I really loved that, and to me it meant that, um, that I really should keep going on this pathway. Embers had a grant. Part of their misguided is that you wrote this grant, you spent a lot of time on the grant, and then nobody actually read the grant, which I think is very, very frustrating, and I don't advise it if anyone here is running some sort of Embers type thing. Um, and then I applied for another internal grant. So everything, all the grants are failed grants unless they have red around them. So, so far there's no actual successful grants up there except for the one I took over from someone else. Um, and then I did get a tiny internal travel grant, all right? So these are all grant writing. Um, and then I went to SAM in Dallas, and that was a turning point because that was the time after Embers that I said to my research division director, I said, you know what, I learned a lot from Embers, I'm super psyched, I'm gonna be a researcher, and Embers just told me to start applying for grants. And he looked at me and he said, he said that's, that's not how it works. And I was like, what do you mean that's not how it works? That's how Embers told, Embers told me that's how it works, and he's like, you need more training and you need real mentorship. And I was like, but you, you could be my mentor, and he's like, I don't count. You need, you need a mentor who is a federally funded investigator, and at Bay State there is one, and his name is Peter, and he's fabulous. And so I got home, and I called Peter, and I said, hi, what, what do I need to do? And I sat down with Peter, and he said, you need to go back, and you need to get a master's in research, you need more training, and you and I need to start publishing papers together, because you can't um, get your K at, with me as a mentor if we have no track record of working together. You can't just sort of cold call me and put me on your K, no one will believe you. So we started working with some data that he had access to that answered some of my questions, and we started writing papers, and you see the papers haven't started to sort of tick up yet. But that's where the mentorship ticks up, and it's really, really important, right? Nothing was going to happen without mentorship. Um, so then I started master's classes, um, and I had a very, very supportive chair. So I was sort of going back to full time, but part of my time was, um, was dedicated to um, my own education. It was essentially like doing a research fellowship. I essentially started a research fellowship. Um, and I had a grant writing class right around that same time. And my hospital invested in that grant writing class, and it was expensive. And the grant writing class was just about specific aims. But the women who ran the grant writing class were, were hardcore, and they didn't mince words, and they said, who else is going to be on this grant? And they made me find an appropriate grant. Like, they pushed me and pushed me to find, and we found an RO3. And I was like, I'm not going to get an RO3. Um, they pushed me to find it, and they pushed me to find the right person, um, and I got the RO3, which was amazing. But it took a lot of investment. So the hospital invested in the, in the research grant, and then even after that, my department invested in hiring this grant writing company, essentially, to help me and push me. They didn't write anything for me, but they pushed me and pushed me to have the right people on the grant, to have the aims, and to have it written the way that it needed to be written. So it was really time and money from my institution and me to get the RO3. But you see, like, okay, we're starting to get somewhere, and we have, we're having the right mentorship. So that ended, added another mentor. And note about both these mentors, the first mentor is a hospitalist, not emergency medicine at all. The second mentor is a PhD in communication, and she works in the, in the setting of, of, of medicine. Um, so not, not emergency medicine at all, but fabulous mentors. Um, the first one is at my institution, the second one is about an hour away. So I can meet with her, but we don't see each other on a daily basis. Okay, so then we go to SAM in San Diego, um, and now SAM is starting to do 
um, some stuff in terms of shared decision making, which is what my K is about, or now it's what my K is about, but it was what, what I was interested in at, at the time. So I started to get involved in the organizing committee at the consensus conference, um, which was a great way to meet people, great way to get on papers, and I introduced myself to Eric Hess. So if you know Eric Hess, he's sort of one of the big names in emergency medicine shared decision making, um, and if this is what I'm going to do, i got to find him, right? So you go up and you find him and you say, hi, I kind of want to do what you're you want to do and I've got myself another mentor and and people like him and a lot of great people who are doing awesome things are, are happy to hear from the rest of us who are sort of in the process so cold call introduced myself to him he is a wonderful mentor and he is the EM shared decision-making mentor that I needed to sort of round out the mentor team all right so let's see after that so because of the RO3 I needed some qualitative training so I flew to Canada, where there's like a one-week qualitative training research institute. It was great. I loved it. I just gave a class yesterday morning on qualitative methods. Um, it's, you, you just do it, and then you get better at it. And, um, and now I feel like I'm a pretty good qualitative researcher. I have about three or four qualitative papers. Um, I think qual is awesome, and a lot of grants these days have a qualitative aim because you can have a hypothesis, but if you don't understand why your hypothesis works the way it does, um, you're not going to go anywhere. So you need to understand backgrounds and the qualitative stuff really helps with that. Um, so then I did the qualitative training. I was then full-time in the masters. I think when I started the masters classes I couldn't get in full-time. So now I'm full-time in the masters. I'm working 50% clinically and, um, and I put in a letter of um, intent for a big foundation grant to do essentially exactly what my K is. The letter of intent was accepted, which was great, except the grant wasn't. So I spent all summer writing that grant, but it was good experience. And uh, you get a new au pair, because your au pairs have to leave every two years. So then you have to adjust to your new au pair. There's some space in there with some failed au pairs, so that's always a, a little bit of a problem. We can talk about that later if you're interested in learning about au pairs. Um, and then I put in my first KL2. So uh, we were affiliated with Tufts at the time, so I had the option of putting a KL2 into Tufts. Um, so that was number one, and that was rejected. It has no red line around it. Um, and then I uh, turned the KL2 into an EMF grant. Uh, one thing I should mention on all of these grants, I got zero feedback. So the Embers grant, nobody read. The internal grants, nobody gave me any feedback. Um, the EMF grant, the feedback that I got on it was, sounds like Dr. Schoenfeld's going to do this project anyway. And that was literally, and I was like, are you kidding? So this is why you need mentors, because if I had just written this myself and gotten no feedback, that would have been even more painful. But right, you're not learning anything, anything as you go from some of these rejected grants, which is pretty painful. So no feedback on the KL2, no feedback on the EMF grant. Another tiny internal travel grant. So those are not that helpful, but at least it's something on your CV, right? So theoretically, you're sort of building up your CV. All right, let's see what's next. All right, so then there's SAM in New Orleans. I think that that was the one with the consensus conference on shared decision making. And, um, and I feel like I've kind of arrived a little bit because I have like one grant. I have, I have this RO3. Um, and it, it's nice because it makes me more comfortable meeting people and introducing myself to people and sort of getting out and sort of networking and collaborating more. Uh, let's see. All right, so then my, my institution um, changed a little bit. We got a new um, head of our Office of Research, and we decided to create these grants called Grant Development Grants, which gave us protected time to work on a grant. Um, so that, it, that was a really tiny grant in terms of my work, and it got me a ton of time. So that was really nice, and if you have chairs, this is more directed to people who aren't in the room, our administrators, this is important. You need time to write these grants. So if you're working full-time clinically and you think you're gonna write a K, it's gonna take a long time and it's gonna be hard. Um, so this grant development grant covered 20% of my time for four months as I, worked on, um, as I worked on writing this K. And remember that when I was meeting with Peter three years earlier, we were talking about the K at that point. What is the K going to look like? What do we need to do to support the K? All right. So we put in the first attempt at the K, and this was about, I want to say, a year and a half ago, somewhere in 2017. Um, and and it, we thought it was awesome because we had spent forever working on it. And he has a number of um, K mentees, and it was triaged. Triaged means that it um, didn't get discussed, so there was no discussion of it. Um, but the feedback, thankfully, was useful. Like, there was actually feedback, which was great. And the feedback was actually pretty straightforward and very easy to fix. Um, so at that point, I finished the master's. Uh, we got our third au pair. There's two children getting older. Um, and I put in another KL2, because this is what you got to do. You can't just wait for the, the, the KO8 to keep going. Um, I actually got the KL2, um, and then I got the KO8. And then in there is a whole bunch of bizarre stuff with HRQ saying, 
well, actually, some, our funding line changed, so despite the fact that your score is completely fundable and would normally be funded, it's not going to be funded this year. And, and it was like, so what, so what do I do? They're like, well, you can, you can wait and see, you can resubmit, there's sort of, you have these weird options that don't make any sense. And then a month later, it was like, oh, guess what, we changed the funding line again and you're fine. Um, so there's all sorts of things that happen and you just have to sort of roll with the punches and then eventually, ideally, you get there. Um, for me, one of my colleagues had, um, had had four attempts on two different Ks, and so I sort of felt like, hey, if I can do it by four, then, then I'm fine, then I'm sort of par. So I think that it's very important to remember um, that getting a K on your first try is very, very unlikely. Um, put it in, put all the work you can into it, but, um, but that's okay. You need to try again. I think that in the world of grants, it's, perseverance is going to be really important. Um, something I don't talk about in here, but where I'm happy to talk about more, is, is sort of the mechanics of what that grant needs to look like. So because I do shared decision making in kidney stones, I looked into NIDDK, right, kidney stones. And they looked at me and I talked about my specific aims and they looked at me and they said, we want to build um, kidney researchers and you don't really sound like a kidney researcher. That, that's what our Ks are for. And I was sort of like, oh yeah, you nailed it. I'm not a kidney researcher. Um, and so it was like, it doesn't make sense to go to NIDDK. And so then I switched and went to AHRQ. Um, and if you're doing something that isn't really disease specific, AHRQ, and it's more of quality or patient communication or safety, uh, AHRQ may make more sense than a, a specific in, um, institute, which is a big challenge in emergency medicine um, because a lot of the stuff that we want to do doesn't have like a disease. Um, I think that's it for mine, yeah. So um, I'm happy to talk about any of these aspects of this after the, the, the less generalizable, um, but oh, we're gonna keep going and then we can bring out questions. Um, hello, I'm uh, Fahim Gurgis. I'm from University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville. And um, thanks to Mike for inviting me to, to give this talk along with the others. Um, so just a little bit of background on UF um, and where I work. University of Florida in Jacksonville is an ancillary campus to the University of Florida in Gainesville, which is the big sort of academic hub um, where the medical school is based. And so that kind of contributes to my story because it made things more interesting for my career development. Um, so I took a job at UF Jacksonville in 2010. Uh, I came from a county sort of program at uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein in, in uh, the Bronx in New York. And uh, I wanted to go there because it was an academic program. It had a high acuity population. I knew I liked critical illness. I had actually considered doing a critical care fellowship, but um, I actually decided to work at UF Jax because it has sort of the population that I wanted. And I also like to work with the underserved population, which it really had. And it has a, a big residency program. So I took that job. I had no idea or inkling that I was interested in, in research as a career. Um, I was sort of put in charge of research as a, as a chief resident in residency, so I kind of helped uh, residents do their projects, but that, I don't think that really fully counts, but um, I, I did, I did some, some work there, and that, that means I, I had a little bit of a background interest. And then um, about eight months into it, Phyllis Hendry, who's our vice chair of research, um, which was a fairly new division in our department at the time, came up to me and she said, do you want to be in our research division? And I th thought about it for a little bit, and I said, that kind of seems like where I might fit better than other parts of the department. So um, I did that. I started thinking about what I was interested in, and I decided I was interested in sepsis, which I had been for quite a while. Um, you know, one of the things that you'll get out of my story is that I really did not have great mentorship for a long time, and I also was really pretty, um, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of direction. So that's part of why it, I, I went on sort of a convoluted path. But on, in 2011, um, you know, I, I decided to take that position in the research division. And I found the one researcher in my department who I knew was actually pretty accomplished, and it was Bob Weirs, um, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. But I, uh, I went to Bob and I said, hey, I want to do a sepsis research study. And he was like, okay. And, and uh, if you know Bob, he's a, a patient safety researcher. He's a study design expert. Um, but he, he wasn't a sepsis researcher, but he actually was very willing, very helpful, spent a lot of time with me. Um, I probably spent about three years uh, sitting in his office every two weeks for two or three hours watching him do things with my data and Stata while I would try to pretty much absorb whatever I could from him. 
And so we wrote this kind of, um, we wrote this little Dean's Grant for University of Florida, $10,000 thing for a prospective study. Um, we got it funded. I was pretty happy about that. And then I went to the Embers course, which Elizabeth shared, um, and that got me more interested in it. And one of the things I did realize from that course was that I was just really interested in research. Like I needed, I needed more actual training. Um, so in 2012, I, I think I kind of copied what Elizabeth said, which was I wrote a bunch of grants, like a bunch of training grants, which everybody was like, no, nope, this isn't getting funded, this isn't getting funded, this isn't getting funded. And the only uh, real mentor I had at this point was, was uh, Bob Weirs, who everybody would look at and say, he is not a sepsis researcher and you're trying to do a sepsis project. And sure, he's got study design expertise, but that's not what you're trying to do, right? So that was a big hole. Um, I wrote a KL2 and I was actually told by the University of Florida that I wasn't allowed to apply for it because I was in Jacksonville and I couldn't attend the SAC lunches that they have in Gainesville. <laughs> so um, that was a little bit disappointing. Um, so I found this guy in Gainesville, his name's Ron Shore. He's in charge of the TRACS program, which is a pre-K like program for clinical researchers. And I went and met with him and I said, you know, I want to do this research Path, career path thing, how do, I, how do I do this? And Ron basically said, well, you should probably go to a different institution. <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, I said, well, do you have any other advice for me? And he said, well, uh, find a sepsis mentor. So um, by a stroke of luck, it turned out that our program director knew Alan Jones, who had recently gotten his um, race trial funded through NIGMS, and uh, they had actually been classmates at Carolinas. Um, and he emailed him and he said, hey, will you talk to him about his research? And he said, sure, why don't you fly out to Mississippi? Um, Alan had just taken a job at University of Mississippi. That's also where I met Mike. We went out to lunch. I flew over there and Alan basically told me two things. He said, um, one, I'll probably, I'll tell you what to research because I think I know what I think is relevant. And um, if you follow what I'm telling you to do, um, you'll, you, you know, we can probably come up with a pretty cool project. So I said, okay. So we started off with a systematic review of, of long-term organ dysfunction, just a, a project that he came up with, which was pretty cool. And uh, the other thing he told me was that um, you have to have the fire in your belly. Like, you have to be motivated. Um, I'm not going to chase you down. I'm not going to, you know, for me to do this long distance, you know, you got to be motivated on your own to do this. I'm not going to, like, uh, try to force you along this path. And I said, okay, absolutely. So um, I followed what Alan said to do. Like I said, I, I met Mike. We started some collaboration at that point. Um, and then in 2014, someone came to our institution who had some background in um, HDL, which, you know, cholesterol, which is actually what I study now. And um, she had had some NIH funding, um, not anything related to sepsis. And I got really creative and I create, crafted this sepsis grant looking at, at HDL and we submitted it to Society of Critical Care Medicine and that got funded. And that was a big bump for me because um, once somebody external to your institution uh, decides to actually, you know, give you money to do a project, believes in your idea, believes in your ability to actually carry it out, that's a big deal. That was a really big deal for me. So um, we got that and I also uh, wrote a K23 at that point. Um, with her as a mentor, and I also had Weirs on there, and I had Alan, and I just got destroyed. Um, I got a, a score of 63, which actually everybody that I asked after that was like, is that a real, like, is that a score? Like, can you, can you get a 63? I, I didn't know that was a real thing, and I was like, well, I got it. It says it on the thing. So on Eric Commons, it's there. Um, so, so yeah, I got this score, and uh, we had actually recently hired a new dean of research at University of Florida. His name's Tom Pearson. Um, he'd been a PI on a CTSI at Rochester. He'd been the PI of a KL2 multiple times. Um, and I managed to get like a five-minute meeting with him and said, hey, Dr. Pearson, I had the scored K23 and I need to resubmit it. Can you help me? And he was like, oh, okay. Well, while I had submitted my first draft of my K23, uh, there, a group in Gainesville had submitted a P50 grant to NIGMS for a sepsis study. And so the comments that had come back on my first case submission were, we just gave X million dollars <laughs> of money to a sepsis group in Gainesville to start a center, and they're not on your mentorship team. And so when I met Pearson, Pearson was like, uh, yeah, let's get a meeting with those guys. So sure enough, he got me a meeting with those guys um, because I had tried to actually get meetings with them, but they were too busy to talk to me. Uh, and so when I got them in the room, they all said, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll help you. Um, so I spent about a year and a half driving to and from Gainesville, um, revising my, uh, my, my K23 application. Um, and at the same time, Pearson said, well, I'm the PI of the KL2. I think this is a cool, pretty cool project. Why don't you submit it for a KL2 and a K23 at the same time? I did that, submitted the KL2, got it funded. 
um, submitted the K23, and eight weeks later, I got that funded. And so I was on a K KL2 for eight weeks, switched over to the K23 in 2016, and, um, and that's it. And, um, you know, one of the things that I learned, like I said, I didn't have a lot of direction. Like, I had, I had mentors who were good mentors. Every mentor is different. Um, but one of the things that I really needed was somebody who had some expertise in K grants and, like, who actually would say, this is really, this is the path that you need to take to get a K grant. Um, and that wasn't explicitly told to me for a while. And it was something that I really figured out on my own. Finally, when I think I kind of got closer with um, the Gainesville group, they, they really had a better sense of what I needed to do to get it, to get it funded. So um, I put this slide in there because people have this tendency to look at their mentorship team as like, so I'm an emergency medicine person, I want to do sepsis, maybe clinical trials or observational work, so I have to find the person who does exactly that, and that'll be my mentor, and then I'll get my K. And so what I managed to do was um, you kind of create this mosaic, right? Like you, you take all these different people who have different expertise, and you, you bring out that expertise for your application. So, um, for example, my stuff looked at lipids, and I had a guy at UCLA who was the, the when, when NIGMS reviewed it, they, they saw him as like the lipids expert, and he was at UCLA. So that was a big problem. And I, there was a guy in Gainesville, his name's Christian Lewenberg, who's still one of my mentors, who ha actually had quite a bit of lipids expertise, but it was, it was a while ago. So what I did was I, I sort of brought that to the front. I made sure his biosketch reflected that. And he, he did have that expertise. And I said, here, here's my local lipids guy. And then I have this sort of local sepsis team. And then I have this, this committee of people who all um, can help me with my, with my career development and with my project. And, and they, really, they really bought that. So I think one thing that I would just mention as a, advice that I would give you all is be a little bit creative with how you develop your mentorship teams. If you can't find the one perfect person at your place, that doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, I would emphasize that nobody ever really told me that your mentors really need to have active funding. Like they really need to have funding. At least one of them does. And I think uh, Dr. Newgard mentioned that in the last HRQ talk. They will expect that, and it's not just a money thing, it's a resources thing. Is it, do you have access to data sets? Do you have access to, to coordinators? Do you have access to somebody who publishes a lot, who can help you publish? Um, so even though it sounds like it's a money thing, it's really, there's a lot of reasons for them to say that your mentors need to have active funding. Um, the closer to you where you're, in, to your home institution where you're applying for your K, I think it's, it's better. I don't think that's necessary, but I think that does help, um, particularly if the study section kind of knows who your mentors are. That's, that doesn't hurt, um, but I don't think it's required. But anyway, that's my, uh, that's my, that's my convoluted path, but it, but it eventually worked. So I'm happy to answer any questions for, for people. Hello. That one works. So, what we'll do at this point is, I, I think we heard three very different ways that people got to the K Award, and I think um, I really like all their stories because it, I think it highlights a lot of the things that you need to do to be successful in research, and particularly in EM research. And those are things like, uh, I mean, grit. Uh, is really important going through this process. Submitting, resubmitting, meeting all kinds of different challenges, personal challenges, institutional challenges, things like that, and you have to find creative ways to do that. And I think um, emergency care in particular, um, also mentioned during the last session, faces some challenges because your idea may not fit with uh, specific institutes as much because what you're doing may not be organ or disease specific. And so finding creative ways to do that is, as evidenced here, very doable, but you have to get creative with some of these kind of things. And I think the way to do that is um, there are many different paths as, as illustrated here. So I'd, I'd encourage you guys, if you have any questions, just step up them to the mic. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just kind of get things rolling a little bit. But I, I wanted you guys to talk to us a little bit about when you guys decided to do a K, um, what, was, what was your primary motivation? There's lots of different things that go into this. There's just the kind of line items so that you can get to your R. There's um, mentorship. There's additional training, protected time. Like, how did these things factor into your decision to pursue K award funding? 
Um, so I, I did think about, right, so first of all, I think if you're, if, if you're moving forward in research, um, there's a lot more training than you sort of realize when you first graduated residency and you're sort of excited to do research. So there's a ton of training, and that, I mean, and I think that uh, obviously uh, NIH recognizes that because it's a training grant despite the fact that I already got a master's in research, right? Um, they say, okay, you got your master's in research, now you can do it, now you can do some training. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, you, you, you really do need more training um, to be a successful, to be really successful and to do some of the big studies that, you know, we hear about and that really change the evidence base. Um, and I thought about, you know, I had the R03, I thought about, well, maybe I should go straight for um, applying for R's. And my mentor, and a lot of this is really going to come back to mentorship, and mentors with experience with K's and experience with R's, said, you know, we could go for an R, but nothing is going to give you more time than a K. So the K protects 75% of your time. Um, for me, that's for five years. Uh, and that's a lot of time to work on my own skills and work on my own projects. The downside is that it doesn't give you a ton of infrastructure, so I don't have a ton of money for um, research staff and that sort of thing. Um, but it's a lot of time and there's nothing else. No, no R01s give the investigator 75% uh, time. Um, and so for me to have that much time to work on my own research, to work on cultivating the research uh, projects of people around me, um, really made sense in terms of going for the K. And it's from the mentorship perspective, you know, this is sort of considered the natural progression. Um, and, you know, people with Ks are the people who move on to get Rs, and some people s skip Ks, but many people do not. So. Um, it's all right. Um, so f for, for me, I, I echo everything that you, uh, that you just mentioned, but um, I also, for me, it was helpful to understand a little bit more the history of how this, the, the K's and R's were designed. So in emergency medicine, as usual, we're, we're sort of the odd man out, and we're sort of jumping in to research as a, as a group uh, once the system was already established. But the system really was established with the idea that folks would go from a K to an R uh, under sort of the umbrella of an established researcher. And so the K was developed as really the only opportunity probably in most of our careers in which you're going to focus entirely on yourself. You're sort of doing your own project with somebody else's infrastructure, with somebody else's, sometimes their data, sometimes their, their samples or whatever, um, within their infrastructure, and you're sort of carving out a piece that you will then take on and, and, and go do on your own, is my understanding of how it was originally developed. And uh, what's a little bit more difficult in emergency medicine is finding folks who are established that we can carve pieces out. Or, you know, you can do sort of what I think we've all kind of done, which is <laughs> just find your forge, forge uh, onward anyway, um, sort of without that infrastructure, which makes it harder. Um, but now we have infrastructure for the next um, group coming up. Uh, so there's a lot more infrastructure and a lot more to lean on than there was before. Um, for me personally, in terms of why I did a K versus, so I had it, there was the K-12, and so you could make an argument that I could have gone directly to an R. I was not ready for an R in terms of the scientific question and the infrastructure that was necessary for an R. And so I'm actually still in the process. I've got multiple R's that have been submitted. Um, I'm on multiple grants, but not as a PI. Um, so um, for, you know, residency, so my medical training took four years plus really four years. Uh, my research training is taking just as long in terms of establishing uh, my scientific questions, uh, collaborators that I'm with, but not so uh, in line with it, we're stepping on each other's toes. You know, it takes a long time to develop all of that. And so a K was the first step. Um, and uh, from a practical standpoint, the department is not all that excited about Ks because uh, there's a limit on the amount of salary support you get. And so it's a, really it's an investment uh, in the faculty members who do a K. Um, but I think that's really important because then they have a skin in the game. Uh, so, f you know, you have, the department as a whole has to be strategic. There are a lot of reasons to do a K. Um, and for me, the NHLBI uh, was the, the right way to go, given my scientific questions and, and um, uh, my mentorship team. And it was, uh, I, I'm really grateful that I got lucky, essentially, and was able to step into a lot of infrastructure. So that's, that's kind of a little bit more uh, from my perspective. So before Fahim says anything, I just want to take a, a quick diversion here. Let's, um, and maybe Fahim, you can take this one first. Let's talk about money. Because, like, money and K awards is a big issue uh, with your salary and things like that. So can you guys describe a little bit, for those who may not be as familiar, how does your salary factor in? How does protected time work? 
on K awards, what are the requirements for protected time, and, uh, and, and if you want to say something about the amount of funding you actually have to get your study done. Uh, <laughs> let's, so, so talk about money a little bit. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, I think I was, I was fortunate that in terms of like the money to get the study done, our division actually had some external funding from other projects. So um, you get about $50,000 a year on a K, K grant, usually something, something like that. Maybe it's a little bit less, depends, but I think I got about 50 a year. Um, which actually was a reasonable amount for my division and we did have some, like I said, other funding that, that helped with that. So um, that didn't end up being a huge challenge. I think that the bigger challenge for my department was, was protected time. Um, I think in a place that's very clinically heavy, you know, the, there's always that uh, temptation to be overworked even if you're on a K. And, and actually, thankfully, my chair was very invested in me getting this, and I think that's kind of the skin in the game thing, is that because um, we hadn't had one on our campus yet, and um, that was sort of a big deal. Like, that was something that they really wanted. So, um, you know, I think, you, you know, what we negotiated made sense within the 75% protected time that you have to have. Um, I think uh, you have to be really careful with that because that's actually, um, you know, that's a federal thing and you have to actually adhere to what the 75% is actually going to be. So, um, you know, I think, it, it, you know, uh, negotiating that was difficult, but because I had the support of my chair and he knew that we, he really wanted us to get this, um, he was actually okay with, with um, doing what, what we thought was reasonable. So, so that wasn't... Um, that, that, that didn't end up being a huge obstacle. It was an obstacle in the sense that nobody had done it before. So, like, we were trying to figure out what does that mean? Or how does that work exactly? Yeah. Um, and, and, and just to kind of put a fine point on it, um, the NIH has a salary cap of about $190,000 per year. And if 75% of your time is going towards salary, it's about $150,000 uh, to your department per year to give you 75% protected time. However, that means that if your actual salary is higher than $190,000, um, which most of you will be, um, that means that the department is essentially taking a loss um, versus like having you work clinically. So this is something you didn't need to know and understand when you're having these discussions with your academic leadership that um, the department like literally has money invested in you uh, to produce to be successful. Um, so uh, keep that in mind when you're talking with, with your chair and your department and things like that is, is there is a real cost associated with yeah, this. Yeah, it's, it's actually worse than that depending on the grant. So, you know, HR, oh, sure. HRQ's case less, less were, uh, were capped at $100,000 for the investigator. So it basically... And it's institute dependent. To yeah, so, it still has so, to so, they tell, so they essentially say to your institution, uh, she can't work more than she can't work clinically more than 25% of the time. She has to have 75% of the time protected, but we're only paying you $100,000 to cover that 75% of the time. Um, and then additionally, on top of that, the one of the differences between K's and R's um, is the indirects. So the indirects is this uh, fee, if you're not aware of it, that your institution sort of gets above and beyond the grant. Um, the indirects on K's is set at about 7%. So if my, if my K is giving $100,000 towards my salary and unfortunately only $25,000 towards my research infrastructure, um, there's 7% on top of that, which is, you know, $9,000 going to my institution to cover stuff. So if you look at that from my institution's perspective, my salary is not covered. Um, our research support is not, a whole person is not covered. So they really had to decide that this was an investment. On the flip side, if I had gone for an R, the indirects are about 50% for my institution. They're 100% if you're at Harvard and they're different at different places. Um, so your institution can actually make quite a bit of money off of indirects from the R's to help support the research infrastructure. And part of my mentors having funding is that our research infrastructure is supported by all of their indirects. But if you think about it from a chair's perspective, why would, why would, I, why would they want me to get a K if I could possibly get an R? It would be much better financially. Um, so that's one of the challenges. And, and I will say it's changed over time. So uh, when I it like started the K path, I think it was seventy-five thousand dollars was the cap at NI, NHLBI for um, salary support, and so that's changed over time. Um, so helping, so for better or for worse, it's probably going to be different for each one of you at each department, um, and it's going to change over time, and it's going to change with leadership as leadership changes. So the nice thing about that is it's an opportunity to negotiate. The disadvantage is that um, sometimes you have to help folks who are non-researchers better understand how the finances work and what to expect, uh, because um, 
uh, sometimes the expectations may be a little unrealistic in terms of, you know, their return on investment. Um, and so helping them understand uh, ways that we are beneficial as researchers to not only their department but the institution as a whole has been beneficial to me. And I will say, so uh, from a practical standpoint in terms of what is defined as 25% clinical time has changed. A l so the first person in our department um, to get a K23 from the NHLBI, um, there was a lot of discussion about how many shifts per month that would be because that we were the first department, I guess, in our institution that worked on shifts per month as opposed to number of clinic days per month. And so it started out as four per month, four clinical shifts per month, and that shifted over time because it turns out it's really hard to maintain your clinical skills at four shifts a month. So that, I don't know what the future will bring. I think as mentioned uh, in, in the session before, in some regards, and as I think you can see for us, if you're interested in science and you're driven, just go and do it. Um, you know, the, the politics will change and the funding lines will change. And I've been funded at the VA and things like uh, query uh, was a line item on a budget that got <laughs> destroyed. There was like one day query was there and the next day it wasn't because Congress changed something. So, but uh, researchers will find a way. And so um, that's just, uh, that has been a useful uh, piece of information for, for me to keep, just keep just keep swimming, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few minutes left. I just want to give anybody the chance. If you have any questions, um, please uh, come up. Ooh, ooh, uh, can I, can I uh, yeah, put yeah. a quick plug in tomorrow? So um, the VA, we haven't talked a lot about the VA. And I, I am an NHLBI person, but I also work at the VA and uh, love my veterans and, and, and actually I've done NHLBI funded research at the VA. So, but there's a tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in ballroom F we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, funding opportunities in the VA because you can get career development grants through them. Now there's a high level of pain and agony to get into the VA even more than the, NHI, uh, the NIH but um, once you get in there there's some opportunities. So tomorrow at 9 ballroom F. I think the last thing I just wanted to hit on before we wrap up, and I, I think you guys all summarized this pretty good, um, but uh, you know, just to again make explicit, is like the importance of mentorship. And, and I think if you're lucky enough, I, I was, I think Candace, you were, to have somebody in your department who does have a federal funding track record, like that can really help these discussions with the chair and chief and things like that, but if not, finding advocates uh, to work for you, um, either in emergency medicine who are known, who can kind of vouch for you and s speak on your behalf is, is a huge thing. Um, I will also say, as I think every single one of you said, um, cold calling, that like our community is small enough that cold calling some of these experts like works more frequently than you would think. Um, I've made a ton of good collaborations and, uh, you know, lifelong friends out of doing that. And I, I think we have a small, pretty tight-knit community. And so uh, I would encourage you guys to go to these people's presentations at SAEM, uh, you know, didactics like this. Meet them in person. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself to program officers and um, do that work. I, I think that goes really, really far in kind of building this stuff up. Um, but with that, uh, do you guys have any other parting words? I will stick around afterwards. And, yeah, if people have, have individual questions, please come right. us. And, um, and I think that our email address, I think you can reach us through different things. So definitely uh, drop us emails for sure or come get our email addresses. There's only one other Candace McNaughton in the U.S. She's a naturopath in Seattle. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference.